So it, it's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Kamali. Uh, Dr. Kamali and I got to know each other through a collaborative study that we did when Dr. Kamali was working at the University of Michigan. And I was really delighted when he, uh, he was looking for a job in Boston and we were able to collaborate further when he came here. Um, Dr. Kamali is uh, not only a researcher, but an extraordinarily savvy clinician. And as I had mentioned earlier, one of his jobs is to be able to help people in the inpatient unit where he, he's one of the leaders there. Um, so he works both in the inpatient unit and in the Daunton Family Center. Um, so he's going to tell us about mania and psychosis. Um, and when he's done, then we'll, we can break for lunch. Uh, then we'll have the, the panel afterwards, which people really find incredibly helpful. And after that, I'll be talking about bipolar depression to end up the day. So Dr. Kamali. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Dr. Nuremberg stole my line. I was going to talk about the seventh inning stretch and rec uh, ask everyone to get up. It's we're halfway, more than halfway through. So uh, I appreciate all your patience. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be here. Thank you, everyone here, for uh, spending your morning here trying to learn more about uh, bipolar disorder and research. So as Dr. Uh, as Dr. Nuremberg mentioned, and also thank you to the Dotton family for, uh, for uh, allowing this to happen and supporting this. Am I? Uh, OK, uh, that's one other problem. I tend to move a lot. I move my hands, and I tend to walk. So I'll try to uh, be unnaturally um, sit still here so that, um, and I apologize again. Please, please remind me if I move too far away from this, because as, as I, re I realize right now, you probably weren't hearing what I was saying. So um, as Dr. Nuremberg said, I, uh, I have uh, two clinical roles. I do, uh, oh, that would be great. As Dr. Nuremberg said, is everyone hearing me? OK. I'll just, uh, I'll just try, to, uh, I'll try to be like this. OK. As Dr. Nuremberg said, I, um, I do clinical work in the bipolar clinic. I see patients. I, I also do research there. And I'm also on the inpatient unit, where I see uh, people who are hospitalized in the acute setting. Uh, the Blake 11 inpatient unit is 24 beds. In a 1,000 bed hospital, you can see how 24 beds is disproportional. Uh, we have 24 beds. It's an acute med psych unit. We see uh, uh, individuals when they're generally not doing well. They're in a crisis. Um, so I see quite a few people with uh, acute mania and with psychosis. I also see people who are uh, severely depressed, and Dr. Nuremberg will talk a little bit about that. Um, I'd like to start the, uh, the conversation with a bit of history. And you may think, why am I talking about history? And the reason I want to bring up history is because um, we still have significant stigma associated with psychiatric illness, associated with mental illness, with depression, with bipolar disorder. The stigma has been present for a long period of time. Um, we would look at history and people would describe psychiatric illnesses as being possessed by demons, um, being bewitched, or um, um, some kind of a magical spell. Or so they, they had explanations for psychiatric illnesses in the past. And right now, people will talk about, you know, some people, it still exists, that see psychiatric illnesses as uh, um, deficits in, wi uh, in willpower, deficits in, in personality, and how people are, um, they just need to kind of do what they need to do and get better. And um, so th there's, there's still significant stigma going on. But I want to point out also when we look at history that uh, even in the, in the historical past, people would look at psychiatric illnesses and try to explain them as diseases. These were considered diseases even historically. So given that, um, I guess, okay. So there, I don't have any. Uh, so given that, I'm going to go back 2,500 years. So we'll be here for a while till I get back to modern day here. Um, so food will be cold, or if it's cold, it'll be uh, gone before, uh, behind that. Uh, so we were, we'll, we'll talk about Hippocrates, um, fourth century before Common Era. So he describes uh, melancholia. He describes these symptoms, and what you see here can be mapped onto the DSM. He's talking about aversion to food, despondency, sleeplessness, irritability, restlessness. These can all be kind of seen as similar to how we, as modern-day psychiatrists and modern-day doctors and psychologists, look at psychiatric diseases. 
But it's also interesting because he uses some form of physiological explanation for, for this disease. He talks about melancholia being black bile. He has a physiological and biological explanation for um, what can be described as an agitated depression. So even thousands of years ago, people were, were recognizing, even though there were people who believed that people with psychiatric illnesses were possessed by demonic spirits, there were individuals who recognized that these were medical conditions. Aristotle talks about how um, these psychiatric conditions are not rare, and they're also seen in many different individuals. He uses the example of Plato and Socrates and talks about how they had melancholia. Um, I'm going to talk about Avicenna. Avicenna, or Ibn Sina, is a uh, medieval um, physician. He practiced in um, what's modern-day Iran, and he, uh, was, uh, he, he was influenced heavily by the Greeks and their uh, medical uh, knowledge. And during the, the, mid, uh, the Middle Ages in Europe, where the knowledge of the Greeks was pretty much lost, uh, individuals like Avicenna were the, um, were the uh, respite for this knowledge. They contained that knowledge. It, uh, his book uh, was trans, uh, he translated and wrote a book about uh, medicine. It's a six volume textbook. And he, um, this knowledge was maintained and it actually later on, this knowledge went back to Europe. If we look at this book, uh, just on a side, it's, it's kind of an interesting, the book that I'm using this is called The Canon of Medicine. Um, uh, canon or, or qanun is, uh, it literally means law. That's what the tra literal translation is. He also wrote a law textbook. So he wrote a medicine textbook and a law textbook, you know, talking about overachievers. Um, he, he, the textbook of law that he wrote was called shafa. Shafa means healing. He sort of plays on these words. The healing of society is through law, and the healing of individuals are through logic, um, law, uh, the laws of medicine, and um, these are medical conditions. So if you see here, he describes mania in this book. He describes it as having symptoms of anger, hostility, aggressive behavior. Again, these are very similar to what we describe in the, in the DSM. And again, similar to, similarly to what we do right now, he recognized around 1,000 years ago that this is closely related to melancholia. People who have severe depression also have episodes like this when they get very manic. And he, res he recommends medications and treatments for this. He doesn't go out and say they need to be exercised or they should be punished. He describes medications. He ha there's a variety of herbal remedies that he talks about and mentions in his books. And he talks about the treatments for, for these conditions. This gentleman that we see here with this uh, fantastic looking mustache is Emil Kreppelin. Uh, American psychiatry has a lot, uh, to, they owe a lot to him. Uh, Dr. Kreppelin was a psychiatrist in Germany. He was around the same time as Freud. Most people know Freud, not a lot of people know him. He is how we, he is where we have our common terminology. Um, that's where it came from. He worked in an inpatient psychiatry unit. He uh, worked there for years. He um, had at some points 2,000 people in that hospital. Um, he, would, he was able to monitor these people who would be admitted. Unlike what happens right now, in our current state, people get hospitalized on, on Blake, for example. Our average length of stay is eight to 10 days. Um, so it's not a huge amount of time that people are there. He, people would stay there for months. So he was able to monitor and observe the natural course of these conditions. And he saw, in the individuals who presented with manic symptoms and psychotic symptoms, he saw two distinct trajectories. Some people would come in very ill, and they would get better, but they had residual symptoms, chronic paranoia, chronic symptoms. And then there were others who would fluctuate. So they would have periods of time when they would be very elevated and periods of time when they would be very depressed. Using that descript, uh, the, description, uh, uh, the description of long-term uh, outcomes, he described one group as dementia precox. Uh, we call that schizophrenia right now. The second one he described as manic depressive insanity. So he used these terminologies to identify two different classes of illnesses one with a longer uh, chronic course, one with a relapsing and rem remitting course. This was used, his sort of, uh, this pattern of classification was used to um, develop the DSM. Uh, this kind of style of uh, classification was used at the DSM. And so we see here, the, these are the diagnostic uh, classifications for mania, for bipolar disorder. So uh, as you see, and this uh, similar slides have been presented earlier, this describes ab abnormally elevated 
and expansive and irritable mood. There's also extreme uh, elevations in energy, changes in self-esteem, grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, pressured speech. So um, all of these are, uh, these are the symptoms of uh, bipolar mania. That's what mania is, and that's really uh, the, uh, these are the symptoms for mania. And it has to be, there's a time element here, it has to be at least a week. So this is for an adult, and these are uh, symptoms of mania as an adult. So how do we make diagnoses? We are still hampered by limitations of technology, and the other problem, obviously, is the extreme complexity of the brain. So our diagnoses are primarily, it's basically clinical. Um, whatever testing we do, whatever medical ex uh, examinations we do, whatever blood work we do, is really not to diagnose the conditions that we diagnose in psychiatry, but to rule out other things that could mimic or look like uh, bipolar disorder. So um, we look at psychiatric conditions through clinical, um, the clinical uh, uh, glasses. Um, there are many instances I have this has happened many, many times. I am interviewing someone on the inpatient unit, someone who's been brought there sometimes against their will. They don't want to be there. They're unhappy about being there. Someone has issued a section, um, an involuntary commitment order, and they're in the hospital. Um, I'm doing an assessment. I've reviewed their charts. I've, I've done an examination. I've done an assessment. And then I say that I believe that you have this condition. And they say, well, how do you know? You know, you haven't done any blood tests. You didn't do a PET scan. You didn't do an MRI. And I ex have to explain to them that these don't exist. And then they say, well, how do you know? And that's really, f it, it, it's a valid question. It's a valid concern. What, how do I know if you're just not being prejudiced against me? How do I know if you just don't like me? So these are the limitations that we have. We ultimately are going to make our assessments based on a clinical observation. We're going to look at the symptoms. We're going to gather information from many different areas. And we're going to come up with, a, with an assessment and recommend that assessment to the individual. What, what is important here is the therapeutic alliance and the co connection between the doctor and the, and the patient. If the individual believes what I'm saying or trusts me, then they may accept it. If they don't, it's going to be a tough time for me to kind of convince them of anything. And I tell them, if you don't trust me, you should not be following my recommendations. I wouldn't do it. If I didn't trust my doctor, I would not follow my recommendation. It's my job. It's my responsibility to gain your trust. And we have to go over this, and this is a process. So the diagnosis, again, the important thing is to make sure that we are not categorizing normal behaviors as abnormal mood disorders. And this is a criticism that comes up against psychiatrists a lot. We get uh, criticized that you're just pathologizing normal things. Um, so. Again, we have to be uh, wary of this, recognize that our, uh, our, the patients that we work with have valid concerns. And then the second part with the diagnosis is to make sure that we're not missing medical causes. There are many, many um, medical conditions that can mimic as mood disorders. And, and for our particular topic of mania and psychosis, a mania can be mimicked by illicit drugs, cocaine, methamphetamine, stimulants. Mania can be a, um, a side effect of certain medical conditions, certain types of seizures, um, certain medications that are administered to individuals like steroids. Um, and, and we want to make sure that we're not missing that. We, we want to make sure that we're not missing those things. So the tests that are done for psychiatric treatment are primarily to rule those things out and make sure that what, what's left, when all of those things are gone, what's left is that we kind of, this person fits the classification of bipolar disorder. Let's talk a little bit about psychosis. So we, uh, the topic we're talking right now is mania and psychosis. We've described a little bit of mania, the historical um, background of mania. Let's talk a little about psychosis. So in, in my practice, in the clinic, I don't see a, a lot of psychosis. But in the hospital, I do see quite a bit of it. It's, uh, one, of the, it's one of the very extreme emergencies associated with psychiatry. And so is mania. Acute mania is one of the psychiatric emergencies. People may need to be hospitalized. So when we're talking about psychosis, we want to be very clear what we're talking about, um, what our definition is. And, and as, as doctors and psychiatrists, our definitions of psychosis are basically these symptoms. Um, hallucinations, when there's a perceptual um, experience, but there's no external stimuli. I might feel that there are bugs crawling on my skin. I might have that sensation, but there's nothing there. So that's a, that's a tactile hallucination. I might hear someone talking down here, down here, and saying something, calling my name, and saying, get back to the, to the microphone. Um, but, then, um, but then there's no one there. So that it would be a perceptual, a perceptual problem. 
So that will be an auditory hallucination. And, and similar to that, we have visual hallucinations, tactile. All of our, all of our sensations can have the uh, uh, hallucinatory uh, experience there. So these are uh, part of our psychotic symptoms. The other parts are delusions. Delusions are fixed false beliefs. This is when it gets really, really tricky. Um, it's fixed, which means that uh, a discussion, logical uh, conversations cannot change it. And it's false. This is the tricky part. Um, this requires an element of judgment when I'm making the diagnosis on my part. I'm actually saying this is false. And I have to be very careful. And this is where we have to be careful as doctors, as, as providers, that we're not, again, considering a, a very strong belief that an individual has as a false belief. Um, in general, in some instances, it's, it's relatively easy. This, this fixed false belief does not fall at all within the cultural experience of that individual or the societal normal experiences. In that case, it's not just me saying that this is fixed and false. It's also society and cultural experiences. But you can also see how that can be tricky. Uh, the, this, is, um, this is a tricky um, diagnosis to make. But we believe that there are biological bases for paranoia, for grandiosity, for paranoid delusions, for grandiose delusions. And they manifest themselves this way. This is, again, a, if we had a test that we could do, a blood test or an imaging test that said this is a psychotic symptom versus this is just normal beliefs, then we, we would be, it would be great, we just don't. So we still are dependent on the clinical uh, experience and the clinical judgment of the doctors. Um, the disorganization and thoughts and speech. So that's a little bit of a tricky uh, uh, symptom to diagnose in the way that um, I talk with the students about this. Um, we tend to kind of fill in the empty spots of a conversation. So I hope my conversation right now is not disorganized. I think I'm, I hope that I'm not kind of rambling all over the place. But if I were, you would probably be able to fill in the empty spots and say, well, I think this is what he means. And this is a common thing that we do as humans. Um, in order to make that diagnosis, I have to tell the students, you know, don't think logically. You can't be filling in these spots. You have to think about it very, in a very abstract and very, in a very concrete way because there, then you can sometimes see some disorganization going on. Sometimes the disorganization is extreme. The individual starts at a certain topic, goes all around, and never gets back to the question that was asked or gives a story that's completely unrelated. Um, and then we have catatonia and disorganized behaviors. Catatonia is another one of the uh, medical emergencies that we have in psychiatry. Old textbooks of psychiatry have these pictures of individuals in state hospitals with catatonic symptoms. Uh, a catatonia is a, is a, mo it's a movement disorder and it's a, it's a physical uh, manifestation where people, um, it has two elements. Is there's catatonic immobility where people stand still. They might kind of stand in a certain way. There are certain pictures in these old textbooks that show someone like standing like this for hours and days. Um, or they will be moving purposely, uh, uh, in a purposeless manner. So they will, um, the patients that I've seen with catatonia on the inpatient unit will be in, the, in their room for hours. Then they might come out of the room and then just kind of pace the hallway back and forth without any meaning. They might go into the bathroom, turn the water on, turn it off. And they do repetitive behaviors. And this is called catatonic excitement. This is a true emergency in psychiatry. It needs to be treated immediately. As you can see, if this condition does not get treated, it can lead to dehydration. The person won't, doesn't eat, doesn't drink, and they could die. It's a very ser serious condition. And um, the two treatments that are most effective for catatonia, and we'll talk a little bit about later, are um, um, medications, so Ativan and, um, and uh, uh, ECT. So the, these are the, uh, the main treatments. Uh, all right, so we have 10 minutes, so I'm going to kind of start going through this a little bit faster. Um, hopefully, it won't be disorganized. So, oh, um, oh, the last one was negative symptoms. I'm just going to very briefly talk about negative symptoms. Negative symptoms is not a prominent feature of bipolar disorder. It's more prominent in schizophrenia. It's the lack of motivation, drive. It's not about depression. It's lack of drive. Let's talk about um, the lifetime prevalence of these disorders. Again. The bottom line for this slide is bipolar disorder is not rare. It's very common. 1% have bipolar 1. Up to 4% have some form of bipolar disorder. This is not a rare condition. It's a common condition. Uh, diagnostic challenges. Some of this uh, we'll talk about. It's rare to miss full-blown mania and psychosis. It's, a very, uh, it's not a complicated, uh, it's not too complicated to, to diagnose that. What we get into trouble is with the diagnosis of hypomania, which is a when we say hypomania, it means a less intense form of, uh, of mania. The reasons for that is 
a number of that is that one of it is that there's a limited insight or less insight for mania than there is for depression. When people are depressed, they generally are able to experience the depression and recognize it. But when people are manic or hypomanic, sometimes they mistake that for just a normal mood and they may not seek treatment for that. Given the same problem, if you ask them about the history of this condition, they may not necessarily recognize how, um, that they were ill at that, this point. Um, there's lack of systematic assessment by doctors in, uh, themselves. They may not systematically ask. They might see someone come to them for depression. They'll recognize the depression, but they don't systematically ask about bipolar and mania. Um, and then the last one is stigma. There's stigma on parts of the providers. There's stigma on parts of the individuals. And there's stigma on, part of, parts of, on part of the, uh, of the uh, society. Um, again, some other diagnostic challenges. Bipolar disorder presents itself in different ways. It's a very interesting illness where you have extremely different clinical manifestations of severe depression and severe mania. They're not at all similar, and they present in the same individual. Um, the prominent presentation with depression is another problem. It, most people will present mostly with depression, and they may not even had a, may not have had a manic episode. So. And, and then suddenly it turns out that they actually have bipolar. And then there are comorbidities, comorbidities with substance use, comorbidities with anxiety disorders, comorbidities with personality disorders, lots of different medical comorbidities. And that makes it just more difficult to diagnose. And then treatment options. So the very first question we have to ask when someone presents with mania and psychosis is, what's the appropriate level of care for this individual? And safety is the primary issue here. We want to make sure that the individual is safe. And what I mean by safety is, are there a risk to themselves, a risk to other people, things like that. So that's the very first step. You have to make a determination, is this individual safe? And if they are, where do they go? So sometimes they need to be hospitalized. Individuals get hospitalized for bipolar disorder when they're severely manic, sometimes when they have mania with psychosis, when there's a concern about their safety and well-being. And in many instances, unfortunately, these hospitalizations are involuntary. They may not, at the point, recognize the need for hospitalization and voluntarily come in. Um, so, again, a level of care. Where do they fall within the le level of care? So, um, again, uh, uh, Dr. Nuremberg went over this. Um, the only medication that has been approved for the treatment of bipolar disorder that has been specifically developed for bipolar disorder is lithium. Everything else comes from other fields. Um, all our anti-epileptics were um, uh, uh, used for bipolar disorder. And there was a period of time where every anti-epileptic was being tried in bipolar disorder until they realized that not, everyone wor not every one of them works. Uh, and some of them actually are making things worse. So it, this is sort of a, a shocking, shocking uh, piece of information for a disease with a, a prevalence of 4%. It's a shocking piece of information. The other um, concern is the level of insight and acceptance of treatment. And we talked a little bit about this. Uh, many times when individuals are in the acute phase of an illness, when they're extremely depressed, when they're extremely manic, they may not have full insight into the severity. When they're depressed, they might think, I'm just being uh, a bad person. I've, I've been a failure. They may not recognize it as actually depression. When they're manic, they might think, I'm just super just happy. I'm just very creative. There's nothing wrong with me. So this lack of insight is a huge obstacle to treatment. So what's the role of family? How, or, and I use family here in, in a loose term. I'm talking about the support system, loved ones, people around the individual that are there. What can they do to support the individual? And I've kind of put down a number of different topics. I think one of the things is support healthy behaviors. Obviously, things like getting to the appointments, getting to the doctor's appointments, helping them with uh, you know, paperwork for getting their insurance in, in, in hand. Support the healthy types of behaviors. And then to listen to the individual and their concerns. Individuals with bipolar disorder have concerns. Some of those obviously are very legitimate. Some of them could be because of their illness, but they have to listen, having an empathic listening uh, style. And then reminding ourselves that stigma is a huge problem. And the stigma not only is about society, it's also about the, the individual's um, own kind of lack of, uh, uh, like it's healthy not to want to be ill. That's the healthy approach. But when you have an illness, you have to accept it and try to, try to kind of treat it to the best. And then there's two other things about um, opening lines of, keeping lines of communication open with your provider and with a, with a doctor for families. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon for people to say, I call my doctor or call the hospital, and they say, we can't talk to you. Um, it's not an unusual scenario. This is about HIPAA. It's about pro pro confidentiality. Um, important. Um, 
I don't think anyone can tell any one of us not to talk to someone else. That's, there's no law that prevents that. The law says you can't disclose confidential personal information to doctors, to other people. So that's the law. So sometimes the doctor will say, I can't talk to you. I don't have permission from the patient. That's actually an error. You actually can talk to whoever you want. You just can't disclose personal information. So it's many times that I discuss with a patient. I, I, it's happened many times. I have a patient who does not give me permission to talk to anyone, to their families. But then they, they call me. And I don't disclose any information. I don't even acknowledge that I know them. And then we kind of talk about general things. And I think that's really important to, if that happens and that obstacle comes up, to um, go over that. Um, I'm going to go very quickly over um, the medications, just a very brief thing. So I'm going to go, I mean, this is obviously, um, I'm just going to go over some big picture things here. There are. There's the CANMAT, the Canadian Network of um, Mood and Anxiety Treatment Disorders, and I ISBD, the International Society of Bipolar Disorders. They've done these guidelines for the treatment of bipolar disorder. And these guidelines are very helpful, but it's important to recognize that these are just guidelines. They're not set in stone, and individuals are, um, are very, very unpredictable and messy, and things kind of change. So with regards to the treatments that we have for bipolar disorder and mania, these are the most uh, common things. These are the FDA-approved treatments uh, uh, that we have. On the left, they're alphabetically listed. Um, those are the atypical antipsychotics, and then we have the mood stabilizers on the right. This is the CANMAT um, treatment. As you see, on one part, we have monotherapy, which means you know, using a single agent. On the second one is we use a single agent, adding it on to lithium or divalproex. So these are a list of, and, and that list is pretty uh, simple. It's all, almost all of the atypical antipsychotics that have been developed for schizophrenia. What you don't see in there is olanzapine, and you don't see geodon. And the reason you don't see it there is because they're here in the second line. And the reason for that is that um, some of these medications have more side effects. And if you look at this list, olanzapine, which is a very effective treatment for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, is a second list. And the reason for that is because of the side effects, weight gain, which is a very big problem with that in extreme sedation. But again, it is a very good medication and works a lot for many individuals. Um, the other things that you see are um, Thorazine, one of the older agents. You have Haldol, and you have ECT um, as the third. And then this is the third line treatments. These are, again, um, the, the prominent one on the third line is the clozapine, which is a, or clozaril, which is a very effective form of treatment. But the reason it's third line is because it has a lot of side effects. Um, I'm going to very quickly go over ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. Um, electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, has been around since the 40s. This is a treatment that has extreme stigma attached to it. It has extreme negative, um, negative uh, perceptions about ECT. It's one of the most effective treatments, though. Um, initially, the treatments were done without anesthesia and with higher doses of electrical uh, currents. So people would have major problems, broken bones, you know, they would have these twisted, um, you know, they would have extreme uh, seizures. Um, modern treatments, and this we're talking about like decades right now, are done in anesthesia suites. There's, uh, um, there is an uh, anesthesiologist there. There's no movement. There's no um, twisting or anything like that. And it's a, it's, it's a generally safe treatment. There's muscle relaxants. And it is, um, this is, this is just a statistic about ECT. Um, they looked at 70% response for bipolar disorder. This is an amazing number for any form of treatment. And if you look at it, the highest rate is 80% for catatonia. Catatonia, one of the most dangerous conditions, is responding by 80% to ECT. Bipolar depression, these are treatment-resistant individuals have a 68% response. So there are many individuals who don't respond, unfortunately even to this, but these response rates are extremely high. Um, a few things about general management of bipolar disorder, and sleep is one of the most critical things for people with bipolar and mania. They are, it's, um, you, it, you know, lack of sleep can trigger bipolar disorder, can trigger mania, and one of the things that we need for patients is to be sleeping when they are getting out of their mania. So when we're rounding on the inpatient unit, when we have a bipolar patient and he's sleeping, we do not wake them up. We, do, we want, to, want them to heal. We want them to get better. And uh, sleep is healing for uh, people with bipolar disorder. It's very interesting that bi people with bipolar disorder, one, and female uh, gender are more at risk for uh, sleep disruption. And then um, very briefly, we talked about psychotherapies. In mania, acute mania, um, and psychosis. Psychotherapies are not the primary form of treatment. They're very effective in depression. They're very effective in maintaining people. Um, 
uh, stable, but in the acute mania, they sort of take a secondary role, and the roles are to make sure that people are taking their medications, adhering to treatment, education, as Dr. Katz pointed out, helping them understand and accept the illness, and um, developing routine and regular habits. And I think I finished on time. <laughs> So um, I, think, I think you raised your hand first, or I think I saw you raise your hand first. I think so, yeah. I just had a quick question. I don't see Latuda listed anywhere. Oh, you yes. Um, you know, that my, well, Latuda is actually much more effective for bipolar depression. And I think Dr. Uh, yeah, Dr. Dr., um, Dr. Uh, Nuremberg will talk about it. It's, it's most effective for bipolar depression, not for mania. It's not as effective for mania as, as, as it is for depression. And for kids, would you... Oh, you, you do adults. But I do adults. You do. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to kind of comment on something that I am not at all have an expertise in. Okay. I'll get it to you. Um, I'm just curious how, like in terms of alternative therapies, um, you know, we're talking a lot about medication and, and cognitive therapy or, you know, psychotherapy, but what are some of the alternative therapies that are being studied? It seems like there's a lot of research on just nutrition, like gut health, um, you know, brain deficiencies, things like that. Um, so for, I, I don't know if, I, I'm not aware of any kind of uh, treatments like that being used for acute treatment of mania. I think the, the issue though is that are we talking about an acute phase of an illness like an acute mania with psychosis or are we talking about general maintenance of health? I think I we have to kind of separate. Cause, like getting to the root cause of mm -hmm. why you're Sure, sure. Um, again, I don't know if, uh, in general, what I kind of prescribe to my patients is basically you have to listen to what, you know, what our grandmothers told us. You know, eat healthy, be, be busy, you know, have a routine, um, you know, take care of your physical health, take care of your um, emotional and social environment. I think these are all absolutely valid and they need to be done, but I can't really tell you with any level of certainty which one of these is the, is the most important or relevant kind of factor here. It's just I don't have the data. And I think she was, uh, she's been, oh, okay, you have, okay, that's okay, well, you can, I'll get you next. Okay, it's very quick, so can you have, like, psychotic episodes during, the, during uh, hypomania, like my delusions, things like that, one question, and the second one is, uh, do you know any antipsychotics that don't have the side effect of weight waning? So the antipsychotics, so, so, the first one is if there are, um, it's possible to have psychotic symptoms and hypomania, technically no. What that th doesn't take into account is that sometimes people are not as agitated, but they still have um, psych psychotic symptoms. That technically is still considered mania. That's considered mania. It's just the way we kind of classify things. With regards to weight gain, um, I think the highest amount of weight gain is with clozaril and olanzapine, and then after that, Seroquel, Risperidone. Um, and then agents like Abilify have some of the least amount of weight gain, or uh, 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 Ziprazidone has least weight gain. And then Latuda has also been found to be least uh, in its weight gain issues, but it's not as, um, it's not as effective in, in mania, though, unfortunately. It is effective for schizophrenia, though. It's been used for schizophrenia. Hi. Uh, you said that sleep was very important for healing in this illness. I'd like to know if a patient has uh, comorbidity with sleep apnea, does that affect their ability to heal? Yes, it absolutely does. And we recommend individuals who have things like sleep apnea or other problems with their sleep to actually make sure that they get treatment for that. The, it, it, it hinders the, the healing process. So we're trying to help them get good sleep, have you know, uh, regulations in their mood, and if they have sleep apnea and they're waking up like 15 times in the middle of the night choking, that's gonna affect their mood, it's gonna affect their mood stability. So we recommend that they follow up. Uh, I don't treat it myself, but there are treatments available for it. Okay. Hello. I think someone um, in the back is. Okay, here, my. Oh, there, okay, sorry. Thank you. Can you please um, differentiate bipolar with schizoaffective and schizophrenia? Yes. Um, very briefly, um, uh, uh, the, the difference between these three conditions is not cross-sectional. Like a, in a cross-section, they can all look very similar. The difference is the longitudinal course. An individual with bipolar disorder 
may have psychosis. They might have delusions. They might have hallucinations. But they only have it when they are in the midst of a mood episode like either mania or depression. When they're not depressed, when they're not manic, none of those symptoms exist. The paranoia goes away. The grandiosity goes away. Schizoaffective disorder is a condition where you have symptoms of bipolar disorder. You can have mania. You can have severe depression. You can have psychosis. But the difference here is even when you don't have mania or severe depression, you sometimes have psychotic symptoms. So individual may not be depressed, may not be manic, but they may still have some um, hallucinations and delusions. And schizophrenia, the prominent feature is not mood problems. They could have mood problems. They can be depressed sometimes. They can have some manic symptoms. But the prominent feature is not uh, either mania or depression. They're, the prominent feature is a thought disorder, psychosis, and hallucination. So individuals who have schizophrenia technically don't have full-blown mania and, or you know, extreme uh, depression, but they have the hallucinations and the delusions. So borderline personality disorder is a completely separate kind of condition that is not necessarily considered as, you know, as, a, as a mood disorder or as a psychotic disorder. It's a, in the category of personality disorders. And it's, um, it's a disorder of uh, impulse control, a disorder of mood dysregulation. Um, it seems to be very closely tied to traumatic events and, uh, you know, uh, tr uh, during childhood or you know, in, in, in your history. And individuals with that respond very well to certain forms of therapy like dialectical behavior therapy. They do very well with that. Um, but it's considered a separate condition. Now, there's, a, there's some, there are parts in psychiatry that would say, you know, well, I mean, I think that some of the people with borderline personality disorder have these other conditions. And that's probably true. Most people with borderline personality disorder have something we call comorbidity. They either have a depressive episode or PTSD or an anxiety disorder or bipolar disorder. They can have that. So it's a separate condition within the classification of diseases. Hi. Um, I was wondering, if, I was told that if somebody's had failures, uh, trials of ECT, that TMS would not work for them, and also was wondering why Lamictal was not mentioned in any of the medications. So, um, so Lamictal was not mentioned because Lamictal also, even though it is helpful for the treatment of um, well, it's not helpful for the treatment of depression. Even the indication for lamotrigine or lamictal is to reduce and prevent episodes of depression. So it's primarily, actually it helps reduce depression and mania, but it's more of a reduce, it reduces the uh, episodes. It doesn't treat them as much. Um, it also is not as effective in, in mania. It's not been shown to be effective in mania. When someone's acutely manic, it doesn't help. There's a number of reasons for that. One of them is that it's in just in studies that they just it hasn't been shown to be effective. And then with regards to RTMS, I I, I agree. I think that is clinically um, unlikely. However, the reason when someone is doing that is because we're now at the third level. We've tried some of the more prominent things, and let's try something different. And people are different. Some people will respond to this, even though they haven't responded to that. So f as a first line, it probably wouldn't make sense. But as a second or third line, yes. So um, oh, OK. When Hi. Um, can you explain the correlation of um, Increased anxiety that comes on with the reduction, with reducing the strength of the um, antipsychotic when you're taking lithium at the same time. Like managing anxiety, essentially, besides always taking massive amounts of clonopin. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a very important question and a very complicated question. I don't think I have a simple answer for that. Anxiety, and we didn't really get into that at all in, in this talk, is an extremely big comorbid condition with bipolar disorder and people who have bipolar disorder. Anxiety is one of the most, it's very disabling in many individuals. That's what their complaint is in many instances. They're not manic, they're not severely depressed, they're more anxious. So I think the treatment for that is actually quite complicated. It, um, as you mentioned, sometimes people use benzodiazepines for that. One of the best things that can be done is, you know, so psychotherapies. Psychotherapies um, are very effective in anxiety disorders and can help quite a bit with that. So I think it's a, com it's a, it's a complex question. I don't have an easy answer to that. It's, um, it's complicated. Um, it's a big comorbidity. But I think psychotherapies are what we look at. So when we're dealing with treating mania and psychosis, we treat the, the big symptoms with medications, with ECT. But that means that people get to a point where they're s stable 
then they can start working in psychotherapy to deal with some of these residual symptoms that are still very disabling and impairing, but now you have the ability to work on those things. Uh, yeah, when you say uh, steroids, do you mean dilantin? No, um, no, uh, uh, corticosteroids, things that are used for the treatment of, for example, asthma. An example would be someone who has a severe as asthma condition. They go to the doctor and they also have bipolar disorder. They get a, uh, a, uh, a trial of prednisone, and that can sometimes affect their sleep, affect their mood, and puts them at risk for having mania. What, um, what would dilantin, dilantin be used for? Yeah, yeah. dilantin is an anti-epileptic agent. It's used for the treatment of uh, epilepsy. It's one of the okay. older anti-epileptic agents. It's still commonly used. Um, I think we've got someone, okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering for an adult who's otherwise compliant with treatment, who's on medication, is there such a safe thing as a glass of wine or you know, legal use of cannabis, CBD, that type of thing? What are your thoughts on that? So I, I won't make a categorical no or a categorical yes. So okay, so the thing is I can't say so I, I get that question from my own patients, and I discuss it with them on an individual basis. It's not categorical. You can't, I, I can't say, just because you have bipolar disorder, you can never drink wine again. I can't say that. But there are individuals where I would say that. You just can't drink wine anymore, or you can't smoke cannabis. So I think um, the, the answer to that is it's not a categorical, straight line thing. There's a, no, it's not an absolute thing. But you have to, it's a discussion that the individual has to have with their own physician based on their history, what has happened with them. Then they can come up with a risk-benefit analysis. We do it all the time. When we drink, if we don't have bipolar disorder, you still have to make a risk-benefit analysis. If I drink right now and I get in the car, well, I mean, what's the risk of that? And those are things that we all have to make those decisions. So I think it's important to have a conversation with your provider, figure out what are the risks for you and what are the benefits. Yeah, absolutely. I was just wondering about interactions with medications and so forth. Yeah, so, so in some medications there are, uh, there are some potential interactions, and some there are not. So I think that's why it has to be um, individualized. Thank you. One last question, I believe. Okay. Is neuropsychiatric or neuropsychological testing used at all in bipolar treatment? Yes. So it's used, but it's not used to diagnose bipolar disorder. We don't use, we don't have neuropsych, uh, so that's one thing. Like people will say, well, you haven't done neuropsychological testing, so you can't possibly diagnose me as bipolar or not having bipolar. But it is a tool, it's an effective tool that helps understand the cognitive process of the individual, cognitive deficits, cognitive uh, strengths, and that it helps tailor whatever other treatments they need for them. So it is used, yes, but it's not used as a diagnostic test. One last one? Okay, one, one last one. Oh, I don't know if this is on. Have, um, do you folks, since people with bi bipolar disorder have dysregulated, disorganized thought, has, um, has ther so non-prescriptive uh, therapies like cognitive rehab therapy or advanced neurotherapy been shown to be beneficial for patients with bipolar disorder? So um, it's important to know that the disorganized thoughts that we see with people with bipolar disorder gets better once the acute mania resolves. So that's an important difference, and that's one of the, I responded to another question about differences between bipolar, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. With bipolar disorder, once the acute mania resolves, most of the time, the disorganization and thinking the majority of times gets better. It takes a while. It takes a while, and when, and when they've done neuropsychological testing and research for people, sometimes these symptoms, re the cognitive symptoms remain even a year out, but they get better. So um, once they're better, then yes, you know, CBT is a very effective form of treatment for people with bipolar disorder. It helps many individuals uh, tremendously. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Kamali. Thank you.